me love thee always, then do with me what thou wilt. Lord Jesus, crucify me. The narrow streets in the old city of Jerusalem are virtually empty at this hour of the morning. Still at least an hour before the sun begins to slowly pour its light into this ancient city that is tied so closely to the religious heritage and traditions of the Jewish, Muslim, and Christian faiths. Simon of Cyrene, here in this part of Jerusalem's old city is the Via Dolorosa, or the Way of the Cross. It is the arduous uphill path over which a brutally beaten Jesus Christ carried his cross to the place of the skull, Golgotha, where he would be crucified and then die. During daylight hours, businesses are open and thousands of people jam the narrow way. But at this hour of the morning, about the only people here are a group of pilgrims from the heartland of the United States, retracing the tortured steps of Christ, praying along the way. Father Peter Mary Rookie, a Servite priest, is leading the group meditation. Well, the way of the cross always um, makes a big impression on us, uh, brings tears to your eyes that we're um, making that uh, very um, saving um, journey of Jesus uh, uh, to his ultimate goal to offer himself to the Father. Uh, it seems the Lord gave him a lot of us. Uh, a grace to make that station. When you think uh, he went up that uh, hill to um, Golgotha after being scourged and lost so much blood, and it's a very, uh, very powerful uh, journey to make uh, those uh, stations where he uh, saved us. Father Peter is one of three priests on this 13-day pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Father Mark Barron and Father Andy Davey are priests with the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. It's just another uh, fantastic uh, opportunity to come here and be where Christ walked and specifically to enter into the mysteries because it's those mysteries that help to shape us and form us and change us. This has been uh, uh, the place that I've always wanted to come, to be able to walk where Jesus walked, to be able to eat the fish that Jesus ate, to really meet Christ incarnated in this culture. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. This journey to the Holy Land has become an annual pilgrimage for a healing ministry out of Vandalia, Illinois, our Sorrowful Mother's Ministry. Its mission is centered on healing and reconciliation. Father Peter, this world-renowned healing priest, is the group's spiritual father, mentor, and guiding light. He has helped propel our Sorrowful Mother's Ministry into a powerful and growing healing ministry. As the pilgrims delved more deeply into the mysteries of their faith, they also began to learn more about the life and times of Father Peter. He was born in Superior, Wisconsin in 1916, as World War I was raging across Europe. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1941, just a few months before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Today, Father Peter leads a worldwide healing ministry called International Compassion Ministry. Known as the Healing Priest, Father Peter is a man marked by his fidelity to the priesthood. It's uh, a great privilege to be called priesthood. 
He also exhibits a deep humility. If the Lord does it, I, I take no credit. And a wry sense of humor. The Sadducees, they were the ones that did not believe in the resurrection, you know. So they were sad, you see. Father Peter has now been a Catholic priest for parts of eight decades. His Servite Order is dedicated to serving others under the protective mantle of Mary, the Mother of Christ. That's why Servites, like Father Peter, often take Mary as their middle name. This pilgrimage began in Nazareth. The mystery of the Annunciation has been resonating in me since the beginning. Just being where the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, it has within the mystery its own message. Uh, the message of free choice, of uh, well, vocation, uh, a freedom to, to, to say yes to God and His plan for you. And, and that is such an awesome thing because God and His plan for each of us gives us meaning in our life. God's plan for Father Peter started in northern Wisconsin, where he grew up. He was one of 13 children, nine boys and four girls. He says his call to the priesthood began with a childhood accident. A firecracker he and one of his brothers found on the 4th of July blew up in his face and blinded him. We started trying to uh, make it go off. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Foolish kids, uh, uh, children we were, uh, and so I uh, wasn't going, so I blew on it and it blew off right in my face and blinded me. And uh, the doctors couldn't do anything with me, so uh, my mother and the family prayed the rosary every night. Father Peter believes it was nothing short of a miracle from God that healed him. 
In a few short months, he could see perfectly. Oh, I, was, I just praise the Lord and you know that the whole family, we all rejoice so much. This healing miracle became the foundation for his call to the priesthood and what would become an international healing ministry impacting the lives of untold thousands of people. Her whole passion in life was to live for God and in that way she was God's little girl and whatever he asked of her she was going to do and so that whole notion of humility she realized God is God she wasn't and and there's that poverty of spirit there that was just abandoned to him. Father Peter in imitation of Mary has devoted his life to serving God. His healing ministry began rather innocently when he was sent to Ireland. I think I was about 32 when I went across the Atlantic uh, to uh, uh, help Father James Mary Keene, this very famous priest, a uh, surveyed priest from Chicago. It was, uh, uh, ancestry was uh, Irish. Now, as soon as we got over there and the people asked for a blessing after Mass, and um, some of them returned and said they were cured. And the first thing you know, busloads were arriving. We had to uh, have the services outdoors. I just blamed it on the Lord. You know, I said, I, I know I'm not worthy of doing anything. But some skeptics in the order did not support Father Peter's healing ministry. If you don't believe my words, believe my works. <laughs> Action speaks louder than, <laughs> than words. Anyway, so they, a lot of the priests uh, uh, didn't accept this, these crowds coming to the priory and uh, to be healed, you know. Father Peter was then, in his words, put on the shelf. In 1953, his healing ministry was halted when he was promoted and named Assistant General to the Servite Order in Rome. I was promoted to be removed. <laughs>
Gethsemane was the beginning of the antidote, which was his sacrificial offering, his being disfigured, his being, you know, tortured and scourged and just made a bloody mess so that we can be healed. And so the Lord gave his fiat in the garden, um, you know, to, to parallel Adam's failure, you know, in the, in the former garden, in the Garden of Eden, where Adam sinned and he said no to God and he failed, Jesus said yes in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's interesting that Gethsemane means olive press. And so it's kind of like in the garden, the Lord in taking on sin, he starts to feel, you know, that pressure of being crushed like a grape and being, his life being squeezed out of him. So it's, it's uh, what I say, amazing love. In many ways for Father Peter, the apparent end of his healing ministry was a painful experience. I wasn't doing, you know, what I felt the Lord was calling, called me to do, you know. While in Rome, he befriended another Catholic priest who would provide some good advice to the young Father Peter. That priest today is known as Saint Padre Pio. Saint Padre Pio, when I went down to see him a few times and um, when I was there in Rome and um, his great um, uh, word was Obedi obedienza, obedienza, <laughs> obedience. And uh, so I, I use that as a kind of um, watchword in my spiritual life. But we have the vow of obedience, so what's the use of having it if you're going to ignore it? For all of his priesthood, Father Peter has been obedient to his superiors. He has served in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri, to the crime-ridden ghettos of Chicago, from Europe to Lapland, and many points in between. His healing ministry, for most of his priesthood, has not gained much support from his order. I joking he said well uh, that was a lot of work and who wants to work <laughs> now I've been put on the shelf again for seven and a half years <laughs> that's the way the ball bounces I will be done When I go up on top of Mount Calvary into that central chapel there, that middle chapel, I, I feel like I'm, I'm in adoration. And, and to be, um, especially on, on Mount Calvary, is, is surreal. The one sacrifice of the Mass, which is the sacrifice of Calvary on Calvary, that uh, was very powerful. 
the message of just allowing him deeper into your heart. Take my heart. And I think this applies, you know, in a special way to the priesthood, but but also to everyone to allow Christ's heart to be within, within your own heart, and to be your own heart, to beat with that heart. And that's kind of what I found here. It's incredible that to think that the world was saved on that mountain. You know, divine mercy and his heart was pierced. You know, when blood and water flowed from that side, it signifies what I call, and I've said this, it's the second big bang because through that, the piercing of the side of Christ signifies his entire passion. It's like an explosion of his heart. And, and that explosion is an explosion of love. And from that, we are reborn, we are recreated. It is here on Calvary, now under the roof of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, where Jesus was crucified and died. Less than 50 yards from here, still in the church, is the tomb where Jesus was buried. But it was here on Calvary where the Blessed Mother's heart was pierced. Watching her son die a horrible and humiliating death, Mary stood at the cross and watched. It is this Mary, Our Lady of Sorrows, whom the Servites and Father Peter identify with most. Our Lady of Sorrows went through the most severe sorrows of any woman in history. And uh, just as Our Lady Lord suffered more than any man in history without sin. Our Lady of Sorrows is also honored and deeply revered by our Sorrowful Mother's Ministry, the sponsor and organizer of this pilgrimage. In the ministry's mission to offer healing and reconciliation retreats and conferences to the sick and suffering, it is Mary, Our Lady of Sorrows, to whom they are most devoted. So celebrating Mass here on Calvary, in the spot where Jesus was nailed to the cross, is a powerful moment. Father Peter's life as a Catholic priest has been filled with many joys for sure. From the healing miracles he has witnessed all over the world to the fulfillment of his priestly vocation. But sorrows have also been part of his life. From his obvious disappointment today of not being able to continue his healing ministry the way he believes God is asking him to, all the way back to the first few months of his priesthood and his first funeral. It was December of 1941 when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and President Franklin Roosevelt declared war. He um, declared war and uh, the same year I was ordained, uh, my brother, younger brother Dale, rookie, was in the uh, Air Force uh, and uh, he was dead in uh, January. Uh, uh, just a uh, matter of <laughs> maybe two months after the declaration. Uh, and uh, that was uh, my first funeral.
following Christ demands taking a risk because it says let go and follow the voice of God. And that means living in that insecurity of not being in control. But the funny thing is, is when you say yes and you take that risk, you take that step of faith, you find security in God's plan. Living in God's presence and trusting in God's will have been stamped all over Father Peter's priesthood. Some call him a living saint. He would politely disagree, calling himself just a humble servant of the Lord. During his priesthood, he met many holy men and women, Pope John Paul II, Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and St. Padre Pio. It was Padre Pio who was known for bi-locating. Documentation shows he was often known to be in two places at the same time. Bilocation is a mystical phenomenon now also being attributed to Father Peter. Well, I can't deny them. I mean, so often we get um, letters or uh, telephone calls. For example, uh, 37 telephone calls from Knock, Ireland. Every one of these phone calls had the same message. Why didn't you tell us that Father Rookie was coming to Ireland? <laughs> We've been speaking to him here. He has blessed the thousands of people who gathered here. And then every so often, uh, uh, we get calls like the one from Albuquerque, New Mexico, I remember. Uh, this daughter telephoned us after her mother said, your Father Rookie was here, and he prayed with me, and he blessed me. Father Peter says he has never been aware of being in two places at the same time. Well, the Lord does that on his own. I'm just um, his humble servant. Um, and a man in Milwaukee uh, called, and he thanked us for coming to see him in the hospital as well. I'm all well now and a woman in St. Louis who says she was near death had a similar experience. And she said, Father Rookie came here and, and blessed me now. I felt, I could feel his habit along the edge of the bed and all that and as he uh, prayed with me and blessed me.
look at the ocean, it looks like it goes on forever. It looks like it goes on for infinity. And so I think that the water touches within us that desire that we have for the infinite, for the eternal. And so that's why I think that when we're around the water, it opens our heart to its desire for God. And it's the God that gives us peace and who satisfies that desire for the infinite. And I think the ocean, the big bodies of water, so the Sea of Galilee, therefore, is that kind of sign that points us to God. The Sea of Galilee is a reminder of the many miracles Jesus performed. It was here where he told his first apostles to follow him and challenged them to set out into the deep. This is where Jesus walked on the water. Scripture says the miracles of Jesus are too numerous to record, but in cities like Capernaum, Jesus cast out demons, healed the sick, and restored sight, just like he did for Father Peter some 90 years ago. I think I may have been part of the um, uh, fact that I was healed of blindness, that uh, so many people were um, healed of blindness. Like the little girl from Belfast who was born blind, her parents brought her to Father Peter during some of the first healing masses in Ireland in the early 1950s. They were hoping and praying for a miracle. And uh, I said, you're not witnessing anything right now, but I'm going to ask you to pray this simple prayer and uh, you'll see uh, what happens. On their way home, uh, he and his wife were uh, praying Our Lady of St. Philip and Easy, pray for us. Our Lady of St. Philip and Easy, pray for us. And uh, the little child was in, with the grandma in the back seat. And um, uh, she, uh, all the little uh, girl was playing with the, uh, uh, I guess it was a kind of Venetian blind on the back window. And uh, she was, the grandma noticed she was following what she was doing with her eyes. And she said, my God, she can see. And she could. Just one of many untold thousands of people healed. Men, women, children, healed from things like cancer and blindness. Demons were cast out, all through the prayers of a humble and faithful Catholic priest. Oh, it's the Lord that does it all. I just am doing His work. I'm just following what, our, uh, what the Lord instructed us through His apostles when He um, first began His uh, public life. He um, gave them power to cast out evil spirits and to heal the sick, just as He Himself uh, was doing.
glory and power to the Lord. With his eyes set towards Jerusalem, he'll stay the steady course. Though stripped of all honor and glory, his heart holds no Blessings on you. I'm not worthy of any of this. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for any and all of our dear ones. Six Tours, conducting Catholic pilgrimages for more than 25 years, is the official tour company for our Sorrowful Mothers Ministry.